Coming up, we speak to the Nationals leader, Warren Truss, who says recommendations of a federal coalition's commission of audit would be put into place first without taking them to an election. And in NX Votes, how Australians are searching for news on asylum seekers, Google research reveals some intriguing trends. Now to our MPs panel. Joining me to discuss the day is Labor MP Gay Brodman and Liberal MP Paul Fletcher. Welcome to you both. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Linda. We'll start with the latest proposals for asylum seekers. Here's what the opposition leader, Tony Abbott, said. So what we are uh, saying today uh, is that uh, because of the crisis on our borders that Kevin Rudd created, uh, because he wasn't man enough to leave well enough alone back in 2008, we would be prepared to rapidly ramp up the capacity of Nauru uh, to 2000 and beyond. That's what we're saying. Uh, but we would certainly expect as many as possible uh, to be resettled uh, in third countries, as happened under the Howard government. Paul, the coalition has promised that boat arrivals would stop within its first three-year term, yet the Nauru plan is a five-year plan. Why do you need a five-year plan if boat arrivals would stop after three years? Well, the first thing is that the coalition has had a consistent policy in relation to asylum seekers, uh, and we had that under the Howard government, and that was a policy that worked, and we've maintained that policy. Mr Rudd came to power in 2007 and reversed the Howard government's policy. He abandoned temporary protection visas. He closed down Manus Island and Nauru. Uh, and that is why we now have this year, so far, 17,500 uh, asylum seekers having arrived by boat. So this is a problem which Mr Rudd has created, and it is going to take time to fix. We are very focused on getting it fixed. And one of the reasons why Scott Morrison has talked about the length of time that we are developing a plan for is because we are going to have a very significant, structured and focused effort to deal with this issue rather than the short-term media-driven approach of Mr Rudd and the attempt by Mr Rudd to persuade the Australian people that was ju with just a few weeks to go until an election he's got the magic bullet solution. Gay, the government was, has been talking to Nauru about something very similar. Uh, isn't, isn't this uh, simply an extension of what the government's already doing with Papua New Guinea? Look, what we want to do is to stop people making the dangerous journey on the boats, stop the drownings at sea that are tragic. We just saw recently that little body, that little coffin being carried by that uh, official. It's absolutely tragic and heartbreaking. We want to stop people making the dangerous journey by boat. We want to stop people drowning at sea and we want to stop the people smuggling trade. And, and, and it we seems have a very both... robust policy to do that. And it seems that both parties are now practically in agreement, at least on the way to approach offshore processing. Well, well, the opposition's been a bit all over the place in the last week or so on this issue. I mean, for the last 18 months, they've had uh, uh, this uh, uh, lazy sloganeering approach to the, everything from asylum seekers to carbon price. Now the scrutiny is being applied. Now they're getting uh, a bit more, people are getting a bit more forensic in terms of what they're seeking from the opposition. And now a bit of heat's being applied. And what we're seeing here is melting. We've just seen the response from Scott Morrison today, uh, the response from uh, the opposition today and the last few days. They're all over the place on it. It really is, Lena, if I could say, it really is quite extraordinary that Gay would say to your viewers that the opposition is all over the place. Can I remind you that Prime Minister Rudd, in his second incarnation, announced this PNG policy just uh, around two weeks ago. This was the same man who went to the 2007 election with the very opposite policy. His policy in 2007 was to close down Nauru, close down Manus Island, cease giving temporary protection visas and it is those policies which have given the incentive to people smugglers to carry out their awful trade. But isn't it the case though that, that the coalition criticised the deal with Papua New Guinea because uh, not all of the details were out there, the costs weren't known, it couldn't be said that asylum seekers wouldn't well, return to no, Australia and all those things are true of the policy today no, aren't they? What, what we said of, of the Papua New Guinea uh, announcement by Mr Rudd was firstly we are sceptical that anything is the immediate overnight silver bullet solution. But secondly, if there are elements of value in there, then we are certainly interested in salvage them, salvaging them and using them. The key point is which party is credible 
to implement an approach which is going to address this issue. And Mr Rudd has announced a new policy uh, very rapidly, uh, driven by a desire to get through a short period to the election, try and persuade the Australian people he has a solution to the problem, the very problem he created with an abrupt reversal of the policies that had worked under the Howard government. But your, so your policy is, was put together in a time frame which didn't even allow it to go to shadow cabinet, did it? Uh, our policy or the uh, specific initiative which Scott Morrison has announced is a continuation of the very consistent direction that the coalition has followed on this issue throughout our years in opposition and I might add throughout our years in government if under the Howard government. So the key point is that the opposition has a very clear and consistent track record in this area and it is frankly straining the credulity of the Australian people for Mr Rudd and the government to say that with their dramatic change in position that they are somehow better able to manage this issue than the coalition. Nobody Gay, believes that, including the people smugglers. Gay, we don't yet know how your policy will be funded. If the money is to come out of the aid budget, as has happened in the past, would that be a concern? Well, Tony Burke's just made it quite plain that uh, it will be it will be uh, delivered in the context the budget will be clear in the context of the the economic statement and the budget statements on that, and uh, that really is up to the treasurer to announce. I'm not going to get into speculation about the funding on it. And, and one final question to you, Paul. Uh, apparently, the trip was facilitated by Toll Holdings, a company which already has contracts to deal with asylum seekers on Manus Island or, and, and Nauru. Do you think Toll Holdings would be expecting to get more contracts if a coalition government came to power? Well, look, let's be clear. Uh, the trip was fully disclosed in terms of the funding, and that's appropriate. People need to know uh, who funded the trip. But the key point is this. Uh, Scott Morrison, as Shadow Minister for Immigration, uh, has been working extremely hard to uh, make sure he's right across the facts, he's got a very good understanding of the issues, and this was part of that process. So we make no apology for the fact that the trip was funded by toll. That's been fully disclosed, as is appropriate. But uh, no, I don't believe that raises any issue at all. We might move on now. The government's economic statement is still under wraps, but the opposition is already dismissing it, sight unseen. Imagine what it's going to come out with in its economic statement over the next few days. Uh, there will be policy on the run. There is no consultation with people affected by the policies that are going to be announced over the next few days. Otherwise, I'm sure we would have heard about it. Gay, presumably, uh, while we've been talking a lot about asylum seekers over the last couple of weeks, uh, the really important issues to Australian voters are things like jobs and the cost of living, cost of housing. Will the economic statement help refocus that debate or is it still going to put the... the uh, the focus on how you pay for the asylum seeker policy. Look, I don't know what is actually in the economic statement. As a, uh, if I had a dollar for every person who asked me what is in it and when it's going to be released, I'd be a very rich woman. It's the same as the election date. I don't know what's in it. But what I do know is that it will be driven by Labor values. It will be, deliver, uh, it will be uh, uh, com strongly committed to jobs and growth. It will be strongly committed to ensuring that we remain productive, that we remain competitive, that we can compete in the Asian century. That's what I'm sure will be in it. And, and, and will it allow the election campaign, whenever it's to be held, to focus more on things that matter to the lives of Australians? Well, it will focus on jobs and growth, and that's particularly important to Australians. I mean, the fact that without jobs, you know, in terms of prosperity, in terms of a nation growing and thriving, it just doesn't happen. So growth, jobs, improving productivity, improving competitiveness, that's what will be underpinning the statement. And, and Paul, uh, do you think, while, while, as I said, we've spoken a lot about asylum seekers, that, that the things Australians care about, the things they're likely to base their, their vote on, are other things, other things that, that they have to deal with in, in their day-to-day -day lives? Well, Lyndall, Gay said the economic statement will be driven by Labor values. It'll be driven by Kevin Rudd values. And Kevin Rudd values are saying whatever you need to say to win an election. Let's remember, in 2007, this was a man who told the Australian people he was an economic conservative. This was a man who said the reckless spending has got to stop. He then produced three budget deficits in a row 
totalling $130 billion. He's shredded the Australian government's fiscal position. So what we're there, going to see There was this, a global financial crisis in the middle of that, and, wasn't and there? And what we're going to see from this economic statement is the same thing that Mr Rudd has always done, which is throw money at problems, and he's going to be trying to present the image for a few weeks in the lead-up to the election of being a responsible economic manager. But if you look at uh, his... Uh, what he's been doing over the past few weeks, what he's been doing is throwing money at problems. Uh, for example, uh, just the change on uh, ETS and carbon tax is uh, that several billion dollars which had to be filled. And so you've got a it, political strategy here and then they're desperately trying to backfill that. But isn't, isn't the case with the, the carbon announcement that what the government did was actually claw some money back from people to fund it and it's a, that's a, a, a clawback of funds that you don't agree with? Uh, the key point I'm making is that Mr Rudd is pursuing a short-term political strategy to get to an election. To the extent that he can, he's trying to create the window dressing of being economically responsible. But we know when we examine his record that that is a threadbare claim and we further know from what he did in 2007 that he is quite prepared to say one thing and do the other when it comes to economic management. Okay. So you are quite, quite right. Economic management, economic stability, jobs, lower taxes, these are all issues of prime importance to the Australian people. And that's why the Australian people should be looking with a part for a party that has a consistent plan and a proven track record when it comes to economic management. Gay, Re you're you're uh, the member for one of the uh, two lower house members for Canberra. Mm. Uh, the government in the past has looked to efficiency dividends on public servants to find money. Now that's code for spending cuts. Might it go back to the, the same? Well, what impact would that have if it did? I don't know what is in the economic statement. And as I said, the, we, uh, it will be underpinned by the commitment to labour values, jobs and growth, and getting back to surplus by 2016-17. That's what will be underpinning it. In terms of uh, what won't be underpinning it is a, a, a desire, a hardcore desire for austerity. Now, talking about austerity, I know what austerity looks like. I saw it in 1996 here in Canberra when the Howard government got in. They got rid of 15,000 jobs in Canberra, 30,000 nationally. It it sent Canberra into an economic downturn, house prices plummeted, businesses shut down, the uh, local shops uh, shut down, business bankruptcies uh, skyrocketed and people left town. That's what austerity looks like. Now, Paul, I did want to ask you a final question about the House of Representatives' inquiry into IT pricing. It's found that Australians pay about 50% more for their software. It suggests measures that, that could involve removing geo-blocking, removing the ability of companies to say you can only get your software in Australia from these places. Is that realistic, given that geo-blocking is the way that software companies, that film companies, control where their product goes and how much they charge for it? Well, in a, we'd all like to pay less for every product and service that we buy. That's, that's a given. The question really which this inquiry was seeking to look at was, uh, is there a systematic public policy problem with what Australians pay for IT products as compared to what people in other markets pay for those products? And is there something that government could do about that and should do about that? Now, I'm a member of that committee, but I've been, frankly, a bit sceptical from the outset that there is very much government could do about this. And if the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd government were serious about the issue, they presumably would have announced some policy rather than uh, having a uh, committee conduct a bit of an excursion here. When it comes to geo-blocking, uh, what's been suggested, uh, I think, um, is not very persuasive, frankly. There are a range of reasons for geo-blocking. Um, I, I, it, it's right, as was argued, um, that uh, it can be a part of a price issue, but it can also be there for technical reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in relation to uh, allocating content to particular regions or others. But in any, in any event, um, I think the case for pretty sweeping changes to law in this area, mm -hmm. I don't think has been 
uh, adequately made by and, this committee report. And Gay, do you think in any fight against, against say, Hollywood and American multinationals that Australians <laughs> are simply going to lose? Look, just on this report, I welcome the report and I think that the findings in it are probably not news to most Australians, most Australian consumers, and they're not news to me. I think I commend uh, Paul and the committee for actually conducting the report. The government still has to do a response on it, but there are a, a number of interesting recommendations in here. Most importantly, the consumers are more aware of what drives cost pricing and that market forces determine. And on that outcome. note, we'll have to leave it there. Gay Brockman and Paul Fletcher, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Thanks Linda. That's Capitol Hill for now. Here's Matt Cargill with NX Votes.